Hello, welcome to the very last segment of our uh, conference on investable nuclear energy. I'm Don Atanasio, the director of the Energy Law Program at GW Law and the director for the Sustainable Energy uh, Initiative here. It is my very, very great pleasure to welcome back uh, the person who led us off on this conference, our alumnus and good friend, Stephen Burns. You know him probably as the chairman, uh, former chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Before that, he was the head of legal affairs for the Nuclear Energy Agency uh, of OED, OECD. Um, and with that, I'm not gonna give any further introduction because I think this is a community where he is very well known and respected and I couldn't be happier than to have him wrap up our conference for us. Thank you. Well, thanks, Donna. It, it, again, my pleasure to be here this afternoon and uh, to take off from where Larry Brown, uh, Larry Brown's comment, I promise I will not use acronyms during my, uh, my speech. Actually, one funny story about that. I remember when we started rehiring uh, new lawyers uh, in the late 1990s at the NRC, one of the things I asked one of uh, asked them early on is, "What you know? What could we really do to support you?" And one of them actually said, "I don't get all these acronyms." And believe it or not, uh, I don't know how much the NRC has updated it, but they used to have a, a what they call a new reg, so a publication that was basically nothing but an acronym list of many tens of pages or whatever. So anyway, I'm going to avoid the acronyms, but I'm, again, a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's been an interest, very interesting conference uh, from start to start to finish. And I really do appreciate the diverse uh, set of views and perspectives from uh, regulation uh, to uh, stakeholder engagement and environmental justice to the uh, financing perspective to the manufacturing perspective. And it tells you how this is all integrated in terms of uh, the, the nuclear energy energy field. And um, particularly also uh, with respect to uh, nuclear energy law uh, and those of us who practice who have practiced in, in it or are practicing in it, we know that it that uh, nuclear is not simply about law. Law is not the end or the objective. Uh, law is basically the framework or the enabler for us to uh, obtain safe uh, nuclear energy uh, generation uh, and use of, of nuclear materials. And so that does say we, we really need to have that integration of perspectives and understanding uh, of perspectives uh, that comes from uh, engagement with each other and understanding the different languages that sometimes we speak and as, as well as uh, the, the objectives or concerns that we all have in our, our sector. I would say, uh, again, looking at a career that started right after I came out of law school in 1978 and really ended as a full-time uh, matter uh, just a few years ago, three years ago, uh, toward the end of my, or when I uh, left the commission as a commissioner, uh, one of the things that kept me in this field, which I never expected to do over all those years, was the continued engagement with the technical staff and others, uh, and to, to hear their, you know, their stories, but they're also their perspectives, what they were thinking, what they saw as objectives, you know, particularly for us at the NRC in terms of regulation, how to improve it, uh, how to get uh, uh, more uh, agile at it. Uh, and so that was one of the things is that engagement with others other than lawyers uh, that kept me in this field for such a such a long time. And, and I still continue to have that that kind of in, engagement. So what I thought I'd do just in terms of wrapping up is is draw on perhaps some perspectives that I have from over my career and where I sort of see things going. And, and I will have to say that a lot of the folks who spoke to you over the last four days kind of reaffirmed uh, some of these perspectives or, or, or touched upon them uh, in, in a number of ways. Um, one of the things, uh, I, I also would say to start out with is that we we are now seeing what we see in a, a time of innovation, uh, a lot of sparks going forward where we see the possibility 
of, of adapting new technologies, of looking at, uh, at different ways of how uh, the nuclear can be applied uh, and all. And it, it, we sort of reflect back, um, it's not unusual to have had those kinds of perspectives over, uh, over the decades since uh, the uh, Eisenhower's Adams for Peace speech and then the enabling uh, legislation in the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 that allowed for civilian uses of nuclear energy uh, and the use of, of nuclear materials, particularly um, the, the special nuclear material or enriched uranium uh, that was needed for fuel uh, and those similar applications. But so uh, what are the couple of the things I would say in, in terms of the observation of where uh, I see nuclear law and, uh, and, and nuclear energy? Well, one of the first things I would say is that nuclear was born regulated. And that I find is somewhat unusual among a lot of industries. Now, certainly before there was the Atomic Energy Act, you did have uh, in the early uh, uh, 20th century, uh, when if you go back about 100 years or so ago, the biggest, sexiest new thing on the block was radium and how it could be done, used for anything. And it was considered such a wonderful uh, substance uh, within a decade after the Curies uh, identified it. Um, but what happened was that, yes, there was in the, the 1920s then greater concern about the effects of uh, radiation from the radium sources, and that led to the creation of the International uh, Council on Radiation Protection and standards coming out of there. So that is one, that, although that is one way that, um, that law was reactive to uh, a new technology at that time, when we look at nuclear energy, and particularly under, for example, the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, you basically weren't able in the private sector to use uh, nuclear materials or to operate uh, what we would ca call under the act a production or utilization facility. Uh, utilization facility would be a nuclear reactor producing electricity, for example, unless you had government permission. Uh, and that has been really fairly typical around the world. Uh, and part of that is that balance that was sought at the time is between uh, the um, uh, proliferation or trying to avoid proliferation, uh, as well as uh, allowing the, benef the perceived benefits of nuclear energy uh, and nuclear material to be enjoyed throughout the world. So again, that that I, I would characterize this industry as something that was born regulated. Now, we've had some discussion back and forth um, today uh, over the last couple of days about what that means in terms of where we are today. Uh, and as I think we've, we've noted uh, for the advanced reactor community or small modular reactor community, uh, that means uh, an adaptation. Uh, and not only by the, those who uh, are seeking to have approval uh, or to site and operate or sell uh, new technology, but also the regulator itself in terms of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Because what you have today with respect to the uh, basic regulatory framework is one that is based on large light water reactors. Even though some of these other technologies that are being uh, touted now in terms of advanced uh, technologies have some of their roots back into the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, you still, the basic framework uh, is a, a focused on light water reactors because after all, if you think about those 104, or actually it was up to 130 reactors uh, that were licensed uh, to produce power, uh, most of those, almost all of those, uh, were light water reactors. And the 93 that are, that are still operating today and the two at Vogel that may come into operation within the next year or two, uh, again, are in that, in that same category. Um, but uh, having said that, what you find the NRC is doing over the last 10 years, particularly as this interest has grown, is having to start to look at how you would adapt the current regulatory framework 
to this new the, to the newer technologies. Uh, and there were there have been plans that the NRC had had issued over the last ten years that were focused in that direction. Uh, the uh, other inject was at the beginning of 2019 the passage of the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act called NEMA which then compelled the NRC uh, to create a risk-informed technology neutral framework of regulations, which is now under being under consideration under the uh, so-called Part 53, uh, which would be added to the uh, Volume 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations. So this has been pulling NRC in two different directions in terms of trying to deal with the, the things that are on the table, those uh, initial applications that are coming in uh, from various uh, particular uh, designers or vendors, uh, and also to deal with what does the framework look like. And that, that's going to be a huge lift, I think, for the NRC over the, the next few years. And there's been a lot of debate back and forth uh, over the uh, the direction of this Part 53, I think there was actually a public meeting on, on it yesterday uh, at the NRC uh, dealing with some of the, the new language. But I think what we're going to see, uh, in, as I say, in this industry that was born regulated, that we're going to uh, have this tension over the next few years. And the thing to watch, I think those in industry, I think those in the investment community, I think even those who are, are regulators are going to be interested in is where, where does that all go? Um, another point uh, I would make uh, is there is a greater focus, I think, on uh, harmonization and cooperation uh, in the nuclear field, uh, particularly uh, out with among other countries that have a, a similar interest. And we've heard a little bit about that from some of our speakers, the cooperation with, for example, the Canadian uh, Nuclear Safety Commission um, with their the memorandum of understanding it, it entered into with the NRC. And I think this is a way of certainly trying to leverage the perspectives of two mature regulators in terms of coming to uh, solutions or understandings about what's important from the standpoint of the technologies that we are assessing. Um, again, the, the two bodies, NRC and CNSC, are, are very similar in a way. Uh, in some respects, I was always a little bit more envious of the CNSC because it's a little simpler there, particularly if you look at some of the um, adjudicatory process that the NRC has to go through, which again is rooted in the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, and we can even go further back and blame it on the Communications Act of 1934, for which the AEA uh, became a mod was a mod uh, was modeled after. Uh, but nonetheless, there's learnings that I, I think, and I think Lisa Teal touched on this, that we're making. Uh, from that, that kind of engagement. And uh, again, that uh, builds on some of the things in the last 20 years that have also been important in this area, uh, including the generate, we heard from Fiona Till on the Generation 4 forum, but that, that forum was created uh, to help uh, a, bo a body met, comprised of a number of uh, national uh, authorities who were looking at uh, development uh, of advanced technologies and what they we could learn from each other in, in doing that. And as well as the multinational design evaluation program, uh, which was uh, for which the NEA provides the secretariat, which is a way of looking at particularly those generation three uh, plus reactors, the large uh, light water reactors, uh, for example, the AP-1000 by Westinghouse, the French EPR um, and, and some others, um, how they were being integrated into various countries for, you know, for example, the EPR, uh, which actually will go into operation in Finland. It's still uh, behind, uh, sort of the uh, still waiting to, to get to the finish line in France at Flamanville, uh, and then was going to be at Calvert Cliffs as Calvert Cliffs three. But that was a way of integrating different authorities and looking about how we uh, consider 
the regulatory standards, uh, regulatory um, uh, decisions with respect to uh, those uh, types of facilities. And I will say, for example, on the AP 1000, one of the things the NRC did is it had inspectors observe some of the pre-operational testing of the AP 1000 that was being built in China and was able to use some of that information and those results in terms of its assessment uh, of the Vogel plant as it came to certain um, uh, important decision points about uh, the, the adequacy of the design or adequacy of, of, of the construction there. So I do see that harmonization and collaboration across national borders uh, is going to be continue to be important. And particularly if you look at the advanced reactor and SMR uh, field where you're talking about potentially, you know, basically building the, the, the vessels or the core components uh, in a factory, uh, delivering them for the, from the factory for the installation. Um, and that's going to require some uh, flexibility and adaptability in terms of looking at uh, those processes, uh, thinking about how they would be accepted or integrated into the licensing decisions that a regular regulator makes uh, in their their own particular country. And it, we've also noted a number of times you're seeing uh, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, we, we've been seeing an interest in a number of countries uh, with respect to new what I'll call new build or new entry. Uh, into the nuclear field. You've seen a number of, of folks uh, or countries in, in, for example, the Baltic states in Eastern Europe, uh, such as Estonia, Poland, uh, Slovakia, that are uh, Romania, that are looking at uh, uh, small modular reactors and wanting to basically rely on the uh, evaluation that's been done by a sophisticated uh, or experienced regulator. Uh, in some of those instances, it, uh, it may be a SMR, and there, uh, although Poland and I think even Slovak Republic have talked about some uh, large uh, facilities that they would have underway. So harm again, I wanna emphasize that harmonization and collaboration are going to be important across uh, the international sphere and, and, and for the success, I believe, of, of the US industry. Um, we talked a lot. We started off with Fiona's uh, presentation on ECG and environmental justice in our first discussion. And that's an important aspect of, I think, transparency and stakeholder engagement. And we've heard this a number of ways uh, over the time. If, I, uh, if you look back, uh, it was um, a little over 50 years ago that Sherry Arnstein uh, wrote in a, in a seminal article in terms of public engagement, and she had Arnstein's ladder, and some of you may recall this, and at the bottom of the ladder is, it's basically, hi, we're from the government, we're doing everything right just for you, go away, and to the top, where you actually have a lot more collaboration. Now, I would say when I started out in the nuclear sector, um, 40 plus years ago, it may not have been at the bo bottom of Arnstein's ladder, but there was a lot of talking to and not talking with and not hearing necessarily what folks out there, whether it's you know, members of the general public, uh, whether it's local, government, local and state governments, uh, whether it's other kinds of stakeholders out there. That has changed, and that is an imperative, is very important. And I think Greg Lamar particularly uh, touched upon that in his presentation um, this morning. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's not always an easy thing to do, but it is extraordinarily important if we are to build trust. And I think that's one of the important roles and important objectives of, for example, of the regulatory process is building trust that the regulator understands, is uh, responsive uh, and communicative uh, with the public and with the stakeholders, uh, whoever they are. And, and again, stakeholders means more than just a member of the public. It means those in industry, those who supply industry, it means people in the government. Um, here, you know, wherever that may be, whether the legislature, other agencies, and things like that. So that's, I, I think, an extraordinary thing. And as some of our speakers noted, 
there are areas in which uh, what I, I would call in fact a part of or a key component of transparency and stakeholder engagement is this the, the question on environmental justice and how we remedy uh, situations where we have not been so good um, over the years and perhaps in the early years of, of uh, particularly in the in, in uranium mining uh, area uh, itself. So again, uh, another uh, thing I would emphasize is this transparency and stakeholder involvement as, as a, a thing to keep an eye on and to work at as we go forward. Um, we, uh, another area I would say is, is the international cooperation and uh, collaboration. I've touched on that a bit in terms of the area of harmonization uh, of uh, review and acceptability of new technology uh, applications and designs and how we can move at that. But let's recall that underlying the entire nuclear structure uh, is a baseline of international law and instruments. Some of those you know, from treaty to uh, binding conventions, but also what uh, we often call soft law, a number of uh, precatory instruments that are uh, then adopted by nation states uh, in their programs. And th this is an extraordinary important underlay for in the nuclear sector. I would say, again, if I look back on my career, I, I'd say in those you know, that first five, eight years that I was there, I didn't really have much of a concept uh, in terms of what the international regime looked like. What was the role of the IAEA or the NEA in all this? Actually, I will say up until the early 1990s, so a good 15 or so years into my career, there was no international safety um, uh, convention uh, until after Chernobyl and the, with the impetus of the European community at the time, there finally was ne negotiated the Convention on Nuclear Safety in, in 1994, which stay, is still the hallmark and basically the primary text in, in, in this area. But what we continue to see is underlying our uh, implementation in terms of the nuclear energy field is this international framework. And it was touched on by one of the speakers earlier, I think Kimberly Nick earlier, that you basically have the, the what IAEA calls the three concepts, safety, security, and safeguards. And then more recently, they've added liability because the liability regimes under the IAEA and NEA have become more important. And since Fukushima Daiichi accident, there's been more emphasis on a, a, a greater global commitment to the international liability regime. But the three S's, safety, security, and safeguards, are, are sort of understandable. Safety in terms of how things are undertaken uh, to assure the safe use of nuclear energy, the safe use of nuclear materials. Security from the standpoint of assuring that you don't have uh, adverse uh, impact uh, on facilities or materials because of criminals, of terrorists, or the like. And safeguards really goes to the non-proliferation objectives that nuclear material is not diverted uh, inappropriately and uh, against uh, treaties like the Treaty uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, to uh, national programs that might be uh, uh, un, un, uh, un illegally uh, developing nuclear weapons. So those things underlie the system. And when you look at, again, if I go back to my point about nuclear being regulated, those things are all in there uh, in terms of uh, the basic concepts and regulation, much of it, you know, for example, in new, uh, NRC licensing, but also uh, particularly in terms of safeguards and, and the like, um, uh, uh, under auspices of uh, Department of Energy uh, and the Department of Commerce uh, in, in terms of agreements to um, export uh, nuclear technology uh, to, uh, to other countries. And that will be an important thing as the U.S. Uh, looks at uh, potentially exporting these technologies to uh, other persons uh, in other countries uh, in the world. Um, so 
the other thing I would say with respect to um, on, in the international sphere is, of course, we've, uh, in terms of our cooperation and, and our basic standards, as uh, one of the things I, I think that uh, Director General Grossi of the IAEA acknowledged early on in the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, situation was that what we have in terms of our international framework is one that does not uh, assume um, the uh, threaten threatening of nuclear facilities in terms of conflict zones uh, or the like. Uh, and he issued, for example, a statement with seven pillars about how nuclear safety, for example, should be maintained uh, under the threat of uh, that, for example, the Chernobyl site and also the Zaporizhia site in, in southern Ukraine. And the, the largest, uh, I think it's actually the largest uh, power plant site in Europe, a nuclear power plant site in Europe. Um, how it was threatened by the invasion of the Russians in Ukraine. So I think one of the things you're going to see is more discussion about that context and what does it mean in terms of uh, not only the safety of power plants, a couple of things we noted uh, was the limited staffing uh, that was available at Chernobyl, uh, as well, I think, as Zaporizhia. There was some attempt by Ross Adam uh, to basically become the expert, if you will, down at Zaporizhia. Um, but these things really don't play well uh, or are, are in conflict with the basic ideas under the Nuclear Safety Convention and some of the other conventions. And for, for example, of the responsibility of the operator uh, interfering with that is a problem, as well as that the that national states are responsible for regulation and need access, uh, as the convention provides, to sites that are regulated um, for nuclear safety and nuclear security. So uh, again, I think those are a number of the things that are challenging. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, conclude by saying, you know, our where, where I see our progress, and that's progress not only as regulators, but I think as industry by those who wish to support the industry, either through financing uh, or through uh, supply chain and all that. Our progress, I think, really does require an intentional focus and dedication to cooperation uh, at a national and international level and a willingness to share experiences and to be open to continuous improvement and future improvement in the legal regime will be aided by, again, I think seeking greater harmonization across, this, uh, across the system. And that, it, that requires a commitment uh, to ensuring that institutions, both public and private, at, at both the international and national level, are transparent and willing to engage constructively with stakeholders uh, and, and, the, and, and those interested and ha having, a, as I say, a stake in, in the nuclear sector. Uh, uh, again, if I look back on, you know, legal advisors are gonna continue to play an important role in assisting policymakers and technical experts in crafting comprehensive and effective approaches to further development of the framework for nuclear energy and its application. In these deliberations, I think we can ask ourselves several questions. Are we credibly engaging the important issues in a manner worthy of our stakeholders' trust? Have we ensured a strong institutional capacity at both the international and national level? Have we assured that the applicable international instruments uh, the, the, and standards have been integrated into the national regimes? And does the framework both in the private and the public sector, comprehensively address those objectives of safety, security, and safeguards? And where should we focus for, uh, for possible improvement? I wanna thank you again to have, for having me as the, the closing and the initial speaker here. It's been a pleasure at a, at a fascinating conference and I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>